to act, to be act active. So active you can imagine. To be proactive is to do something in advance or to avoid something happening, not just advance, but strategically. And reactive is to act in response to somebody else's action. So these are all three reactionary movements. Why? Because there was something else going on in the world that these people, today we're focusing on Midwesterners primarily, were reacting to. <clears throat> this is a very uh, pregnant slice of time, 1914, 1934. We have three programs. This morning we'll be looking at the first one, which um, has to do with anti-German hysteria in the U.S. in World War II. The clan, I'm told, will be at 4 o'clock this afternoon in the same room, for the same presenting room. Um, <laughs> and to be honest, I'm going to try to slip into the cow war after this, because what you probably don't know is that in the 1930s, Iowa farmers, including the Dutch here in Pella um, and up in Orange City, were all s swept up in the natural disaster of the Great Depression. And that slide shows about how Iowa farmers, Midwest farmers, actually responded to this great crisis. The program now, though, is called Kicking the crowds, crowds in commas. It's not my pejorative, but rather at the time, World War I. Anti German hysteria in World War I. I got some flack from an academic in Erfurt. I live in Erfurt, the capital of Turingen, which is the state between Zweis and the Frankfurt mine. Right. And he said, Oh, you really shouldn't be using the word hysteria because it, it's misogynist, has to. I checked. <laughs> the behavior of those people who were anti German in World War I was often and typically hy hysterical. They weren't thinking. It wasn't just fearful, it was hysterical. It was exaggerated. The first slide, of course, we juxtaposed the motif of the American flag with that of the then German flag. And it hints at German Americans' sense of ambivalence or being torn, because in those days, German Americans had much more feeling of being close and tied to, to, to Germany. When all those Germans left what's now Germany, remember most of us in Iowa say, oh, I'm German. That's actually not true. If your people came here before 1871, they weren't Germans as such. They were Germanic, but they would have come from Württemberg or the Kingdom of Saxony. They would have come from Preussen, which is later Berlin, et cetera. So millions came from various Germanic kingdoms, principalities, municipalities, city states. Push pull, why did they come? They came for opportunity, they came to escape something. But what's really interesting is that today, German Americans are still the largest ethnic group in this country, not Hispanics. If you break down Mexican Americans from Guatemala, Mexican Americans from Cuban uh, Americans, the biggest ethnic group is still German Americans. Who here has German ancestry? The majority of the room. All right. In the Midwest, it's actually not one fifth as. It, the average is nationwide is two fifths, it's 40 percent. So in the Midwest, it's 40 percent, which is very high, almost half. Um, I was often with our Basim in years past in little towns, Dyersville or Bayogona, and almost all the kids in the school had German last names. Well, excuse me, my machine's not looking quite right. Um, when those Germans came, This is a map from the 1870s. Notice where they settled, up the Hudson Valley, but also pockets. What's now Columbus, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Milwaukee, also later St. Paul, Des Moines. Those are really German cities. You can often gauge where the Germans settled by the breweries. All the major American breweries over time were in German hands. Pabst, Hams, Anheuser Busch, Coors, which was spelled differently than the German way, not the um, cheating English way today in CLS. <laughs> so really you could talk about a little Germany in the middle of the American heartland. But notice that there's almost no German settlements in the south except for a few pockets of Stuttgart, Arkansas, where they raise rice along the water valley, um, and in Texas. Why do German immigrants avoid the south? Any takers? Not works so much. The weather. The weather, the climate, the subtropical. I mean, I don't like to go down there if I can find a wedding. It's too much in the summer. But they detested slavery. In 1848, the Germans had a failed revolution. They tried to establish a democracy, a parliamentary system, not a, a royal 
system based on a cane. It failed. And many of the people, so-called 48ers like Carl Schwartz, they came and they were all hopped up for freedom, democracy, progress, civilization, evolution. He settled his wife, Margareta, in Wisconsin, later in St. Louis. He was Lincoln's secretary of state eventually. He was an ambassador to Spain for, and this is a great accomplishment for a German immigrant. He'd only come 15 years earlier. <clears throat> his wife, you may not have heard of her, but you've heard of her work. In 1855, she started the first kindergarten in America in Watertown, Wisconsin. She brought us the word kindergarten, the garden of children, and the first ones were in German. In fact, um, I had ancestors who lived in Wisconsin, many of you probably had as well, and the wedding certificates and even birth certificates, which some of them are quasi-official documents, were in German. Okay? Now, today, if you break American census records down by county, it's clear that the most German-American areas are still the upper Midwest. And I'm going to say something that's not very PC, but what the heck. <clears throat> Right-wing racist groups have argued that where darkies, where African Americans live, it pulls all the averages down. Employment rates are high. Uh, sorry, unemployment rates are high. Um, the rate of health care coverage is low. Um, levels of education, et cetera, et cetera. I like to point out, by the way, that these people are conveniently forgetting that where the most African Americans live in the rural areas, they're the most English Americans and the least German Americans. So let the white racists in the crowd be warned that um, I'm, I'm going to be very critical of the Anglo culture because there's a link of our national experience, our national history, between ethnic groups. Look at Pella, where today in Pella, Iowa, very clean, prosperous, thriving. If you go to Orange City, it's similar, okay? Ethnic heritage is decisive still. So those people did arrive from the German, Germanic areas. Here they are in Castle Flint in New York, later replaced by Ellis Island. Who are these people who are coming? My name is Stone Orphan. Um, for example, they are the Charmses. I'm going to give you three biographical sketches. The first one is about the German-American contribution to the westward expansion and the settlement of the country, but also setting the American character. Because the American character was still being formed in the, in the 1800s. The Charmses came with their three sons, my great-grandfather, Chris Lewis, or Christian Ludwig, before again, sized it. Then there was a sister Maria, or Mary. They left Kroslin. Kroslin is a fishing village on the Baltic. And what's interesting, this is um, from the 1650s. What's interesting is they left the old world by ship, and the Charmses came, whoops, let's this again. They came to the new world by ship. This is Milwaukee in the 1850s, when the Charmses would have come. And of course, Christ, or Christian, when he got to be looking uh, for a job as a young man, became a railroad crew manager, and he took his men through Dodge County, and there was this Alsatian German family, and there was a spring house by the front gate, and of course he went to get water for his men, and there was a young lass with a bucket getting water from the well. Of course they fell in love, of course they married, and they, like many German Americans, pushed west. Notice that the brochure about western lands of the Great Plains in German, they also had versions in Czech, in Norwegian, probably Danish, etc. I, I don't think they had it in the Netherlands. Um, but indeed, these people responded to the push. What year were the ads? Uh, that was 1880s. And in fact, they married in 1885. And 1886, they got in wagons, went out to the Dakotas. Notice here, too, the map inside of the brochure is also in German. Um, Karten von Nebraska zeigen die Lage der Landereien. So, the lay of the land. They built their side house. The, the newlyweds, the bride, the groom, Sister Maria, his brother Hermann, his mother, his father, is here off the photo. Um, they were doing the American dream. They actually did homestead and prove up in Saudi. And as soon as they got their five years in and settled up, they came back to Iowa. Um, the second sketch is about the Lewicks. And again, I don't mean to be self indulgent, but I know these stories best. Plus, you've got to be proof of what becomes of those dreams of our foreparents. Uh, you're also the product of the people who left Europe and had a dream that they didn't know you. So you are what they try to envision. They came here for a reason, to build something, to expand, and you're the product, as am I. Anyway, the Lewis came from Esslingen, which is in Schwaben, Swabian English, east of Stuttgart. 
And what we Americans don't usually think about, we don't, most of us don't know, you couldn't just leave a Germanic area, just pack up and say, well, I'm going to go to America. You had to get permission. This is the first and last page of a six-page document signed April 13, 1833, 100 years before Otto came to power. Thank heavens we went there for that. Um, the Louis finally got permission, but there was a catch. They had to leave a deposit in case they were skipping out on their debt. Um, and they also had to swear that they would never take up arms against the King of Württemberg. I can tell you, the last thing on their minds was to come back from Michigan or Iowa and take up arms against the King of Württemberg. <laughs> so the Germanic people, as well as the Dutch, the Danes, they were all enchanted by these stories from relatives who had gone before them or from others from their village, letters of great crops and endless stands of wood to um, create lumber and fish in the streams and gold in the streets. And indeed, the Lurics were enchanted with the idea of going to Michigan. So they left Schwaben in 1833. They got their way to Le Havre, got on the ship called the France, and ended up in America. Um, here's the country that they would have come to. Notice there's no Texas. This is all still um, the what was called Freistaat of Mexico, the free state of Mexico. So this was all part of Mexico. That also puts the current immigration questions in a new light when you think about that. They arrived in Manhattan. This is the top of Wall Street Trinity Church. They were in a different North, uh, New York than when you go for an exciting weekend. They didn't experience that in New York. Uh, they went from ship to boat and went up the Hudson to Albany and crossed to New York in flat boats, um, canal boats, sorry, across the state to Buffalo, which had about 8,000 people in 1833. Went between there, getting ready for the trek further the next spring, they went to Detroit. Detroit had just had a devastating fire, and in fact, they were going to lay out a bigger, better Detroit with grand boulevards and squares like Washington, D.C. Um, guess you would have a different plan in mind. At any rate, um, the Lurics found a job on the first, the first railroad from Detroit to Ann Arbor, 1834. Do you know what's uh, amazing about that little factoid? How many miles of railroad track were there in Germany in 1834? Zero. Zero. Can you imagine that you're leaving a late medieval country where there are almost no factories? The Germans were slow to industrialize. The Industrial Revolution took almost a century to, to jump across the uh, English Channel. So the Germans in the 1830s, it was still a, a late feudal society. I mean, they were almost like slaves. They had to get permission to leave. There's a term in German, Leibeigene, which means basically thieves or serfs. Uh, they could do on the frontier. Detroit had maybe 6,000 people. But they could do in the frontier in America what their lands people weren't even doing back in Württemberg or Saxony or Prussia. So this was proof that there was a dream in America you could realize. When they got to Ann Arbor, it was a clearing of the woods. Didn't even have more than a couple thousand people. It was a wide spot in the forest. This was the frontier. It was later the old Northwest Territories, which we got from the British after the revolution. And this atlas of Washington County, 1875, I think, there's Ann Arbor in the corner. These red squares indicate all the farms in German-American hands. It doesn't include the daughters of German settlers who married somebody Anglo and lived nearby. These are just the farms in German names. They called it Klein Deutschland, Little Germany. My grandfather's Aunt Maddie. Um, so the Louis, like the others, built cabins. They sowed the first crops among the tree stumps, and they built farms. Whoops. In reality, this one's actually near Muscatine, but it looked, looked good. Um, <laughs> and they built, of course, the, the first schools, many of which some of us older folks visited. Uh, my mother did. My grandparents did. And after the schools, they built the first churches. Often, in the pioneer days, the schools doubled as churches. What's interesting is this is a map from the 1850s. The Lutheran churches, you probably think, well, there could be any possibility of it. No, they were almost all German because, except for Delaware from the colonial period, there were no Scandinavians in America yet. 
they came later, especially after the Civil War. So these Lutheran churches would not have been Norwegian or Danish or Swedish. Those are many German American Lutheran churches. You see that they're spreading. Here's a photo of the German Evangelical Lutheran St. Matthew's Church in Chicago. It could be in Dusseldorf or Breslau, okay? And the sermons were in German. If it's still saying, I'm not sure that it is, but if you go to these old German American churches, often stained glass windows, they have the dedication. Gewidmet uh, for Frau Schneider, so dedicated name up. The hymn books were in German, the sermons were in German. These people lived in a German bubble. Even the first Jews to what became the United States, uh, this is a Civil War era photo, the one on the left is Orthodox, the one on the right is in a Union uniform. The first Jews were German speaking Bohemian Jews. Okay. <laughs> Of course, once you establish farms and necessary schools and churches to propagate the culture you're trying to build, then the people have a few thoughts left over to build their first businesses. Have you been to Ann Arbor, Michigan? You know the farmer's market? If you were at the farmer's market, you were here because when the Lake Brothers disbanded in the 30s, they gave the property to the city of Ann Arbor. At any rate, indeed, got leave and got low, Lewis, with their sons and their workers, established a millwork. When they got to Iowa, the Louis accumulated some money. They, they, for example, started the bank in Belmont. They uh, found their wealth with cattle and land. That was the other side of the family mine, were just peasant farmers. Um, but the German Americans tend to be very group conscious. Connections and power laid within the family. They were very conscious of who married whom. And a footnote here, by the way, there were German Catholics and there were German Protestants, many of whom became Methodists because Methodist in those days, we're anti-slave. Remember our friend Paul Schwartz, the photograph, the husband of the woman who created um, kindergarten in America? He and others helped found the Republican Party in Wisconsin, in the Mississippi Valley, in Missouri, in Illinois, and Iowa. And there's a reason why the most soldiers to fight the Civil War for capital came from Iowa, because of all the German immigrants who didn't like slavery. Okay, the Germans were adamant against it. And I think it's fair to say that many Germans looked down on the Anglos and the Brits. The Brits up until that time had been pushing slave trade with the Portuguese and others, but the Brits had far fewer qualms in trading humans. Of course, where you've got homes and businesses, farms and schools and churches, you need routes of communication. And there were hundreds, though by, by early 1900, um, there were over a thousand German American newspapers. Chicago, of course, Toledo, Colorado, Herald, um, Sacramento, all the host. So they flourished. German books, there's a whole German book market in this country, German hymn <coughs> book publishing market, calendars. And of course, they brought their beer getting with them. Now, the Germans love to sing, they still do, and to play music. Um, John Philip Sousa, who was a, a leading American um, marching band, composer of the 19th century, half German, half Portuguese. I love his beard. I'm trying to copy it past as I can. <laughs> um, and of course, the men's choirs, remember this, is that menor core, a men's chorus. There'll be a peer, this idea later in our program. And in the 1850s, German Americans were founding the Turnerverein, the gymnastics groups. Um, also, there was a German American baseball team in Milwaukee, in St. Louis, in the Quad Cities. Quad Cities, by the way, has a German American Museum today. It was also a center of German dumb in Iowa, Bettendorf, Bed Village, okay, it's in the name. This was the um, Turner Hall in Dubuque. I, I assume that it's gone, but there's still Turner Halle, it, Halle in um, New Ulm, Minnesota, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and there are also still groups, like in St. Louis, that still do gymnastics, but now you don't have to be German American to be part of it. So, even though many of those early German American institutions have dissolved and disappeared, they've left skeletons of their existence. For example, here's the Freie Bibliothek Lesehalle, the Free Library Reading Room in New York. It's now part of the New York library system. There's Sheffel Hall, where people could go to um, have group meetings. And in another street nearby in New York, it's a bit that says, I need mach stark, unity makes you strong. The Germans were all about community bases, um, cooperative insurance policies, um, like today. I can tell you that, because I live in Germany, that everyone who lives in Germany is insured. I couldn't even be a doctoral student 
when I was still at university without proving I was insured. If I had secretly let my insurance lapse and they caught me, I would have been kicked out. Everyone in Germany who's a legal resident has insurance, period. It's been like that for 150 years. Now, you might find stray buildings that are proof of this earlier existence of a German American culture, but you don't have to look for physical reminders of this. Just think of American holidays. The American way of celebrating Christmas isn't the British way. Read uh, Charles Dickens' Christmas tale with Scrooge. The British celebrated Christmas very differently. It was the Germans who brought art in the colonial period. Christmas trees, the lights, the candles, the toys, uh, the gifts, and St. Nick, St. Nicholas, and all of this nonsense with the Easter eggs. Um, I have about five pounds here more because of this. Uh, last weekend we ate too much Easter goodies, but the Germans bought this. This wasn't the British way of celebrating Easter. Remember the Puritans in Massachusetts and New England? Christmas was verboten. You weren't allowed to celebrate it this way. Not only did they not do it, but you couldn't. Just a nice fun factoid, a footnote here. Do you know until the 1830s, or at least the 20s, all the New England states, former colonies, still had a state church? Congregational. I mean, up until the 1830s, American states, there were some still with state churches. It's not the story you get in the history books. Now, the third illustrative biographical sketch I'm going to offer you is uh, not my family. It's actually a family that you know. This young man left Rhineland in the 1860s. His name is on the um, ship's passage. He got to New York and then kept going because gold had been discovered in the Klondike, where he had a hotel, and he provided guest services. Here's an ad. Fresh oysters in every style, open day and night, elegantly furnished private boxes, and ladies and parties. Folks, you know what? Ladies were in the Klondike during the gold rush. <laughs> They weren't school moms, they were prostitutes. So who is this with their furnished private boxes? <clears throat> I'll give you another hint. He knew where to make the money. He provided provisions for the miners, rope, canvas, pans, scales, the whole kit and caboodle, canned goods. He got so rich that he could go back to Karlstadt in 1901 and haul a bride from his former village. Um, but then it was discovered that the Prince of Bavaria trying to kick him out because he had escaped, um, had, had, had slid away 50 years earlier without doing his military service. And who is this? You know the family. Here's the application for a, a American passport. Friedrich Trump. Fred Trump. <laughs> There's Friedrich Trump with his wife, Donald Trump's father. Unfortunately, the uh, grandfather, the patriarch, died in September 1918 with the Spanish flu, and then the mother was left to run the real estate empire in New York with the boys. But that indeed is Donald Trump's father and his grandparents. Now, we get to the part specifically about the um, experience of German Americans through World War I. All that was the context to show that many German Americans are prospering. In fact, here's a puk, or puck, I guess we'd say in English. Um, how will our German Americans vote? Notice um, there are Yankees or Anglos on the posters in the background, expansion, anti-expansion, gold standard, etc. So it's hard for you kids to imagine this. For us older folks, it's easier because we're one or two generations further back. But in the olden days, there really were very distinct ethnic groups in this country. The Dutch in the 60s, one of our neighbors, Mark Nagel on the road, married a Dutch woman, Pella, and everyone was scandalized. The Dutch often didn't marry outside the Dutch circles. Norwegians, in my mother's day in the 30s and 40s, a mixed marriage wasn't black and white. It was literally German American with, uh, German Catholic with uh, Norwegian Lutheran. <laughs> it was not done. We had a guy that signed the program in, in Decora. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he was maybe 10 years older than me. And he said that the Norwegians in Northeast Iowa, there was a Catholic a uh, little enclave, little settlement, like Proto and I was very Catholic, and they went to the same school, but you weren't supposed to touch the playground because you'd get contaminated, um, and you certainly wouldn't fraternize with Catholics. When John Kennedy ran for the presidency in 1960, it was really doubted that he would win because of the anti Catholic sentiment. For those who stick around or come back at 4 o'clock for the Klan review, you'll find out that, that 
Catholicism really was um, a taboo in many places in the West in that period. So the German Americans were mostly flourishing, and for some supposed a threat. East Coast elites, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Hunt, Frick, Roosevelt, those are all Anglo names or Anglified Dutch names from 300 years earlier. So the East Coast watched with alarm as in the Midwest, in the heart of the country, the Germans were expanding in brewery, in, in lumbering, in farming, in milling. And that gave them pause. I'll give you one more footnote, by the way, for you budding historians. I know that next week you're all going to change your major to history, which is a good thing. <laughs> but um, if you look at Iowa, how many are you actually from Iowa? OK, not the majority. I, I, it's the same in Wisconsin, same in Illinois, same in the neighboring states. The very first people, the white people to come in the 1830s onward were Anglos, were Yankees from New England and the Ohio River Basin. <clears throat> they surveyed the land, with exceptions. Heinrich Tuick was a young man who came from Michigan, surveyed in North Iowa before it was a state, went back, brought his family 20 years later. Anyway, but most of the surveyors were Yankees, were Anglos. They laid out the land in parcels that were sellable. They laid the roads. They started most of the towns. Most of the towns have Anglo names, most of them. And they saw the early institutions, the schools, the colleges, with exceptions. And then came the Europeans, the Norwegians, the Bohemians over by Iowa City and Cedar Rapids and Spillville, the Dutch, OK? The first ones to set the cultural context for the Anglos, for the Yankees. So it also has to do with power. All right, we'll get to that later, perhaps. Back to our program at hand. So in January of 1917, the German government made a big mistake. It sent a telegram which the British government had decoded, but didn't want the Germans to know that they couldn't decode their secrets because they were already at war. The Germans were encouraging Mexicans to join in declaring war against us. Of course, that really displeased Americans. And whoops, April 1917, we ended the war too, which had begun already August 1914. Almost overnight, this is a sign the entry of Edison Park Chicago, suburban Chicago. Basically, as soon as our men began marching off to war, there was a rabid anti-German sentiment that was fanned and grew organically and also forced. These are soldiers leaving Keokuk for the war. Now, take a moment. Here's one broadside. First paragraph, uh, first sentence says everything. But the second sentence says even more. The very thought of Germany and Germany's past and future must be made so odious and hateful to all decent human beings that the word German will for generations to come carry the meaning of all that is vile and inhuman were ever heard. The world's civilization and the strength of our moral forces demand that all that is German in name or thought or deed must be regarded from the cradle to the grave as we now think of lustful, brutish beasts, of murderers, of treacherous scoundrels, of all the vilest criminals who have sunk to the lowest depth of human rottenness. Remember what I said at the beginning about we look at the old pictures and they're very quaint and the beautiful lace dresses women are wearing with their corsets, the big hats, and all looks so fine, but they were different people. And they had some different thoughts from us that today wouldn't be kosher. Like, you know, wherever there's Germany or German, insert, I don't know, Jewish or Israeli, or insert Polish or gay or anything. So this is hate. This, is, this whole story is about the manufacture of hate. It's a hate mill. That's what the story is about. And I told you earlier the statistics that one-fifth of all Americans still have German-American ancestry, and in the Midwest it's four, uh, 40 percent, it's two-fifths. Imagine that was the largest, it still is the largest ethnic group, but could be treated like such a minority, like scum, like the vilest. OK, you get the idea. The bottom of this broadside isn't much better. We must fight Germany and pro-Germanism, whatever form they appear, utterly destroy their power for evil, now in evidence throughout the country. Evidence, evil, German evil, uh, okay, I don't know what the evidence was, but our beloved boys from over there call us to heroic work here to stand behind them and destroy those who are stabbing them in the back from vantage points in America. Indeed, it was total mobilization for war, from the youngest to the oldest, 
male, female, child, adult. Everyone's supposed to be in the war effort, which included, it was assumed to be anti-German, to kick the Krauts, to fight the Kaiser. Now, the Committee for Public Information was actually a government project. I found it interesting that there's so many women among them, <coughs> and their sole task was to generate hate of all things German. That was their sole job, was to produce hate. Interesting sideline, by the way, this is why you're going to change your majors this afternoon and become historians. Um, many of the people who left wartime Washington in the 20s went to Madison Avenue, New York, where they took their manipulation and, and thought control methods and used in advertising to buy the best mouthwash or to buy a new tin Lizzie from Ford. Or, so this was public relations, professional, studied, advanced, which they used later in marketing in the 20s, and then we still do, to get people to do things they wouldn't do otherwise. Now there was the government project, but there were also at least three semi-public, semi-non-profit, uh, semi-private organizations. This one from Mr. Ort, German name by the way, the National Security League. <coughs> It even um, had a funny little badge that people go around feel important and start bossing others around. But unfortunately, unfortunately, seriously, there was a list of their goals to combat, combat German propaganda and add to our fighting power, help to win the war. The um, American Defense Society was even stronger and more powerful. It had a branch in Europe behind the lines. This was the office in Lille in France. and. Um, our future Iowa Quaker-born President Herbert Hoover was involved with that group. It's interesting in these stories you discover the early careers of people who later in their careers had quite a bit of power. You'll see in a few minutes um, others. For example, he was about the business of collecting blankets and clothes and food for those behind the lines. The third group, the American Protective League, had an even more official looking badge and took themselves much more seriously. For example, they denounced people. Here's a report that someone had overheard Mrs. Adolf Graubner at a cafe in San Francisco and took copious notes that she said treasonous things, for example, that war was really a bad idea and we shouldn't fight it. Okay, for this she was denounced and there was a report. Um, you see this is really serious stuff. Some of the best tactics that you find in East Germany before the wall fell or Nazi Germany public denunciations privately, no open accusations, hearsay, whispering, nuance. It's not very pretty. Now, I promised you glimpses of early careers of folks who did have very big careers, like J. Edward Hoover, no relationship to the other ones, as far as I know. Um, he was very ambitious. He had a very sort of private life, but he hid it well by having his big public life. He decided he would deport German Americans back to Germany during the war. That would get into some um, brownie points. So indeed, they rounded up German Americans in the East Coast, loaded them into trains and trucks, sent them to the port, and shipped them off. Now, it wasn't enough to deport German Americans. They decided, Hoover got this going, we would also intern German Americans in this country, and we built three camps, Utah and then North Carolina and Georgia, where literally, like in World War II, the intern internees built their own barracks locked themselves in. They gardened because they were hungry and they wanted to supplement the army rations. Um, trying to make their little cubicles as home as possible. But still, it's not clear who was interned and why. For example, at one point, 29 members of the Boston Sym Symphony were in camp because they had played too much uh, German music. Now, that's a mass arrest. 29 musicians, were they all really saboteurs? Were they all really unpatriotic because they played German music? But they were in a German camp. You see the level of hysteria from this Connecticut newspaper. I mentioned the Menachor. Here, Menachor Club's flags destroyed. But if you read the article from the Bridgeport, Connecticut Evening Farmer, their building was also torched. This is from April 14, 1917. We had just ended the war. Every article you read, they're talking about there'll be um, secret attacks, um, U-boats, schoolboys in the city may aid the United States. One pastor was hissed down for his pacifism and said um, he will go to Germany to convert the Teutons, but will not kill them, himself a German-American. So you see that right away 
Um, there's a rapid anti-Germanism anti, um, and hysteria. In fact, there were legitimate proposals to fence around Wisconsin, to fence in all those subversive, unloyal German Americans. Build the wall. Yeah. Yeah, build the wall. Have we heard that recently? What I can tell you is coming is that there was pressure um, from the top to take out names of any places in America that had German names in them, like Berlin, Iowa became Lincoln, or Marshall Town. Germania, Iowa became Lakota. And many families changed their family names. They changed the spelling, they changed the pronunciation. Um, this was a pressure that, that even people who have been in this country since the revolution that had German American names felt. So the anti German hysteria knew no bounds. As you saw, the men's choir building in Bridgeport, Connecticut was torched. Um, there were a lot of really crazy, wild things that happened. People's houses would be painted yellow for being um, cowards or not sending sons to the war or not buying enough liberty bonds. All right. So for example, people's loyalty was called a question. Um, for example, even before we joined the war, the German American newspaper uh, magazine, The Fatherland, asked, are hyphenated citizens good Americans? Well, Theodore Roosevelt and Angler didn't think so. Okay. So it was treason to call yourself Hungarian American, or Italian American, or Czech American. You should just be an American. So as I mentioned, there was pressure to change place names, like Germania, Iowa, was renamed Lakota. And here's one of the articles, and, and it's, it's listing which towns in America were, were treasonous that had bad names. <coughs> so in Berlin, Iowa, which is uh, now Lincoln, Iowa, west of Marshalltown, the pastor of the local Lutheran church was forced to carry an American flag and parade up and down the street singing patriotic songs because he'd given the sermon in German. All right? Now, hysteria isn't only steered from above. It also comes from below through culture. For example, this fellow, who you'll see again, D.W. Griffith, he's the one who got the Klan all popular in the teens with The Birth of a Nation, a film you've probably heard about in your studies. He also uh, made the film The Hearts of the World, which involves an American soldier who ends up behind enemy lines in France. And as soon as the Germans come and take over the village, Lillian Gish, or the character in the film, of course, is raped and murdered. So even in the popular movie films, the Germans were the bad guys. And it wasn't just films, but also sheet music. What we don't realize in the days before television, before radio, before Facebook, there was a world before Facebook, um, sheet music, every middle class family had a piano, or at least tried to, because it was a sign that you arrived. They had sheet music, very racist, with people black face in the covers, eating watermelons and making fun of black people. Um, Sheet music in the teens saying we're all loyal clansmen now. This sheet music, don't bite the hand that's feeding you. Um, it was a bestseller. I can show you the lyrics in the question and answer period if you're interested. But from all sides, cultural, uh, popular media, the government, the schools, so that even down home Iowa, like in Germania, Iowa, which now is Lakota, um, sauerkraut became liberty cabbage. Um, Dachshunds who were publicly executed in Columbus, Ohio. All the German races of dogs were brought together and killed in public, um, like German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Weimars, Dachshunds. They were called Liberty Dog during the war. German measles became Liberty measles, which makes no sense at all. It started, do you remember a few years ago when we began to um, march into Iraq? Liberty fries or freedom fries, because the French weren't going to support the war in Iraq. It was either Jacques Chirac or was it Mitterrand who was in power in 2001? All right. He said, no, no, we don't want to be part of this experiment. And that was treasonous. And so no more French fries in the congressional cafeteria. They were freedom fries. Hamburger steak became Salisbury steak. In fact, if you go to Des Moines, did you notice that all the suburbs in Des Moines that are built at this period are very Anglo? Oh, yes, I live in Clive. You know, come on. I live in Urbandale. So all the streets have angle names. You go up to Minnesota, to the Twin Cities. All the streets 
west of downtown Saint, uh, Minneapolis that were laid out after 1915, Upton and Xerxes and France, oh, very British. And the fake British half timbered houses, look at Salisbury House built in the 20s. There's a reason why after World War I, things English were the rage in fashion, in housing, in names, children's names. You wouldn't name your child anymore Billy. Yeah, it'd be some George or something very British. So this cartoon illustrates what happened to poor people like Johann Sch Schmidt, who became John Smith. And you can see the shift in culture sure. from Dachshund to some terrier, I suppose, whatever that is. Um, and the products you sold were, everything German was out. Now we take it rather humorously, oh, isn't this funny? Um, even the tar and feathering, but actually it wasn't very funny at all because there really were German Americans who were tarred and feathered. Um, in Iowa, here's a, a farmer in Laverne, Minnesota, Johann or John Mainz, who literally twice was harangued by his neighbors um, and once taken and tarred and feathered for not buying enough Liberty Bonds, not being patriotic enough. And unfortunately, it was too common in those days. Like I said, they wore pretty clothes, but they were different from us. Lynchings were commonplace. Express the South, but not only the South. Here's an Oklahoma African American mother and her 14 year old son were lynched over an alleged stolen cow. Um, East St. Louis, Illinois, Robert Prager from Dresden, an immigrant who wasn't seen as patriotic enough, he was seen as treasonous. 200 people marched him up to the hill and watched as he was about to be hung. Oops, there's something missing. Let me go back. Oh, it didn't make it. All right, um, and don't be fooled that the prohibition that was passed in 1919 had everything to do with anti-German sentiment. For example, this, this cartoon, if this town goes dry, us Germans still hang together. And notice that wooden shoes, yeah. and the, okay? So it might be presented humorously, but the message is very clear. The beer garden was seen as subversive. They even had the nerve to drink on Sunday. All the um, Yankee Protestants didn't care for that. The Puritans, of course, not at all. Cartoons on rule. We are against progress. We rob women, children. We fill penitentiaries and asylums. We waste grain during the war. We waste grain on booze. So all things driven should be poo pooed, even the beer culture. Now, if my mother's great uncle, Hermann, or Hermann Thames, if he sold beer in his general story or sage, I don't know. But we do know that his nephew, my grandfather's born in a house behind these trees, um, he, he plays a role in this, or at least he was a witness of things. Um, there's my grandpa on his father's lap. The boy was in the early photo coming from Grosseline. That's him as an older man. Um, it looks like the Victorian ideal, so the pretty dresses and the long hair and the sitting of the porch, very genteel. My grandfather with his later hosen, by the way, you notice that. Um, only miles away from where he was born, however, in 1918, the good people of Osage, Iowa, gathered up all the books in German, all the sheet music, all the poems, all the calendars, everything in German, and burned them publicly. Spring of 1918. And it wasn't just in Iowa. In Baraboo, Wisconsin, on the public square by the courthouse, which is a building where you're supposed to meet out justice and prudence and restraint, they burned trunks full of German books. They were so proud of it that someone scrawled with chalk on the pavement afterwards here lies the remains of German in Baraboo High School. Did you know about this? 15 years before the Nazis germed degenerate authors and Jews books and sheet music in Berlin, 15 years earlier. We mean Westerners were burning books here. Who knew? Our friends at the American Defense Society were calling for this, total boycott of everything German, prohibition of compulsory study of German schools, universal military training for Americans between the ages of so-and-so, and Iowa's governor, Governor Harding, was only too happy to coalesce. So he declared in um, spring of 1918 the so-called Babel or Babel proclamation that only English can be spoken in public. Here's the gist of it from his own proclamation. I find the real killer is number four. Ah, 
he doesn't speak English, pray at home. Okay? <laughs> so, this is something called, you know, First Amendment. <clears throat> there was a little bit of backlash to this, not as much as it should have been, but a German Lutheran pastor from Sioux City wrote, said, well, what, how am I supposed to get communion to people who don't speak English? Much of my congregation doesn't speak English. They're older, they're immigrants. What do I do? Mayors, like in Danbury, Iowa, wrote in and said, um, what about signage? Streets naming of German names. What about the telephone? People speak in German all the time on the telephone. How should I, as mayor, prohibit that? And the Swedes wrote and said, well, we Swedes are also prohibited from using the non-English language. What should we do? Can't we get an exception? You know, so kick the Germans, but what about the Swedes? <laughs> We're the good guys, right? Even President Woodrow Wilson weighed in and said, folks, we're fighting in Europe in the name of democracy. We have to be careful. Well, we weren't careful enough. Hardy uh, prevailed, and he really wanted all of your ancestors to speak in English, even the Dutch, Paula. One woman said, wait a minute. My mother's a German immigrant. She's ailing. She lives way down the road, muddy roads, via party telephone. I have to call my mother, find out, does she have enough medicine? Is she doing OK? And she took the state of Iowa to court. Now, what's really interesting in this time of hysterical cleansing, ethnic cleansing, if you will, of, culturally anyway, of, of all things German, the Iowa State hymn survived. To this day, is still our song. You ask what land I love the best. Iowa, tis Iowa. Do you recognize it? We're so German that even our state song is a German hymn with English words. But that, that survived, all this madness. In Indiana, Indianapolis, a city with a quarter 20% German ancestry. They forbade the teaching of German to anyone under 21. So that precluded teaching Goethe or Schiller. But they even outlawed teaching German fairy tales from Grimm brothers, because they were, they were from German authors, Little Red Riding Hood and the Pied Piper. They were quite thorough in their banning of German. The Des Moines Symphony refused to play Bach anymore, and Beethoven nonetheless. And even Mozart, although Mozart wasn't a German, he was an Austrian, I guess it didn't matter. So that's highbrow culture. What about lowbrow culture? Here's a recruiting poster, Teufelhund and the Devil Dogs. So again, the Dachshund is the stand-in for all things German. The Bulldog, by the way, we used, but the Bulldog was really British. John Bull, OK? So how did one family react to this? The Lyrics, for example, Uncle Henry. Um, he signed up. He was actually over the compulsory age, but he wanted some adventures and went off to Camp Dodge down in Johnston in Des Moines. Went through boot camp, went to Europe and fought. After he died in the late 70s, we found in his um, possessions postcards he'd gotten as a soldier. I don't know what it means, an express mm -hmm. wagon. I don't know what that means, but I do know what this means. The message, unfortunately, is very clear. So we're going to go German hunting. Because you can't bring back pretzels and sausage and a beer mug and what's called a pickle helmet, a pointed helmet, and a dachshund if you don't eliminate the person that those things belong to. Um, then there's a lot of tell you say, oh, hi, welcome from Iowa. Here's my. Brought for us mine. So we're going to go to German Hunt and bring back more booty. It's very clear. Don't let the comic illustrations lead you to think otherwise. Uncle Henry, as a teen, his brother, my great grandfather, whom I was named, George Michael, Lurie, he was very um, attentive to all this, watching. In the 20s, 10 years later, during the Iowa KKK, they were all smitten by the skew teachings of Stevenson in Indiana. And the KKK, the so-called second wave, which we'll talk about at 4 o'clock, it wasn't outside the South particularly anti-black. It was anti-Catholic, OK? Many of whom were German Catholics. There were tens of thousands of KKK members in Iowa in the 20s. No one talks about it. In my native Mason City, and they are preparing a Klan parade in East Park. And this article from the Postville paper Documents. And we know from family history and news that my great grandfather was on that march. 
going down Pearl Avenue, carrying a coffin. Again, the story isn't about the Germans. The story is about manufacturing hate to take any group, Jews, Mexicans, gays, it doesn't matter. Pick a group, kick them. The Nazis said to the Jews in the, in the 20s and 30s, the Jews are the source of all of our suffering in Germany. The Jews, the Jews. Well, we were crying, the Germans, the Germans. And in the 20s, the Catholics, the Catholics. So this story is really about the manufacturing of hate. Some of the uh, clan printed propaganda during the 20s. It's all anti-Catholic. Um, the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Rotary, basic leaders, the Pope, the Klan would vanquish the Pope's plans. It was said that he was building a palace of gold in Washington, he was going to take over America. And notice this, this great army for truth and Americanism makes Rome tremble. There's the Knights of Columbus warning the Catholic hierarchy. 100% Americanism and truth. People had been taking cues 10 years earlier in the anti-Germanism. Roosevelt, as Theodore Roosevelt said, it's not patriotic, it's treasonous to have a hyphenated name. Be American, not Italian-American, not Irish-American, not be American. So truth and Americanism. Do you hear about this today at all? Is this a term that's brandished about to be real Americans? Anyway, speaking of the Germans in World War I, there were towns that were very German. If you go to the library in Dyersville, Iowa today, across the street is a bank, German State Bank. It's still there. They didn't um, chisel it out. But Dyersville was very German because the Basilica of St. Xavier, um, Anchor, one of only 70, 70 basilicas in America. But I wonder if the people who go there, who worship and use those facilities for, for events, if they really are aware that A, 100 years ago, being Catholic was a dodgy proposition in many parts of, of America, and B, being German was a dodgy proposition. proposition. Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. All German farmers around, if you look in the phone book, they're all German names. Do the tourists who flock there every summer, do they realize this hidden history? I don't, I don't know, it's not. So now we're coming to the end of our program. I'm going to give you a few biographical sketches. For example, we talked about the Lewicks, how they responded to World War I, what about the Tramses? My grandfather was 100% German-American. His wife, my grandmother from Central City, Mount Vernon, was half German-American. Her mother was a Yankee, 1866. She was born the day Lincoln was shot, 1865. Her father and mother had gone a covered wagon from, um, from um, what's the county around Cedar Rapids? Lynn County. Had gone from Lynn County to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. Came back in the 70s. Because she later was a teacher in Mount Vernon in a rural school, and later married the older brother of some of her pupils, a German immigrant boy, her sister Brazilda's husband, George Pratt, an Anglo, forbade the two to ever meet again, and they did until Aki died. So there was anti-German sentiment before World War I, obviously, but not like after the start of World War I, when we entered. So this couple, to further give an example, they married in August of 18, three quarters German, if you will. They should have been about the business of farming. They had their first livestock, first wagons, first tools, their first cow, their first bull, their first hired hand, Harold Hunt, an Anglo. Um, they had their first reaper. Right. But no, Grandpa has something else in mind, and so left the plow and the wife and the coming baby and signed up for the war. By the way, there's a corner if person is of African descent, cut off this corner. You know what this is about? In this way, army recruiters could take all the fighting cards in the fighting box and go through and eliminate all the African Americans. If you come to my program at four, one of the reasons that so many whites were afraid of the Red Scare 1919, is called the Red Summer 1919, because all those African American men that were sent to fight in Europe they didn't fight with American troops because we were a segregated army still. They fought with French troops. And they were treated much differently. And they came back to Alabama and Detroit, and they said, it doesn't have to be like this. That was dangerous. Back to our story. So I can only surmise, because I was quite young when my grandfather died, um, but my mother's older sister, Eleanor, during the war, wanted to date Walter Zolke, a German immigrant. My grandfather forbade it, although he himself was 100% German and grew up speaking German. He forbade that his oldest daughter date a German, but after the war, when he became a chicken feed seller in addition to farming, 
he didn't mind selling chicken feed to his brother Helmut Zolke. Okay, so it's interesting that even German Americans would disassociate and disidentify with their own cultural roots. And the third example I gave you, the Trumps, what about them? We know that after both World Wars, especially after World War II, the Trumps lied and said they were Swedes. Why? They didn't want their potential Jewish buyers of their apartment buildings in the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn to back out because, oh, German association. So they lied and said they were Swedes, which is true. I went to the village Karlstadt um, in the Rhineland. What's interesting is that Trump's mother was an 18-year-old Scottish immigrant who came in 1930, and he's married three um, immigrant women from Eastern Europe. So the whole immigrant discussion. Notice that we don't go around running up Canadians. We don't have raids on, on places where Canadians work, who are on here legally, or French people who are here legally, or German people. It's always the dark people. Okay? There's always an in group and an out group. These last slides show this portrayal of the Kaiser. All things German were embodying the, the Kaiser. And in America, all things German were the wrong food for an American. The idea being that German Americans publicly would hoist the flag, yay, stars and stripes, but secretly in the privacy of their living rooms would cheer, uh, would toast the Kaiser, or drink their beer, and smoke their drink pipes. It's actually quite um, scandalous, these portrayals. And the Germans being beast swine who shred and eat civilization. And of course, the posters, the Germans are always shown as apes, as bloodthirsty barbarians. And this is why we tell the story today. This, these are signs of the manufacture of hate. I promised you during questions and answers, you can look at the governor's full um, rationalization for his proposal. Are there any questions at this point about the story? Things you want to add, problems or praise, things you don't agree with, that you don't understand? This is a good time to ask questions. Don't ask all at once. Yes? So when did the view of Germans start to change? Well, like I said, there was competition between the Germans and the Anglos before. Yes. Um, as evident with George Pratt, he was scandalized that his sister in law would remain a German. But it was nothing like, it was after the Zimmerman telegram on the sinking of Lusitania that more and more Americans said, oh, and the government said, everything German is dangerous. So 1915. I mean, like, back to. Oh, back to. Yeah. Yeah. Has a return to that. When I grew up in the 60s and 70s, when we played in the Grove, there were the bad Germans and the American soldiers. I mean, when did it change? I grew up thinking about the evil Germans. That was in Northern Iowa in the 60s and 70s. When did it change? I don't know. I, I suppose it has changed. I guess the difference would be whether you can separate the idea of the evil Germans in Germany from German Americans. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it, you know, my I don't have any direct memories of that because you know, I'm, I'm a generation too young. Uh, my mother grew up um, in Indianapolis. Her uh, name was Duke. Uh, her father was German American. Uh, mother was DAR. <laughs> um, and during World War II, she remembers being maybe slightly embarrassed by the German name. She had a, a boyfriend that teased her by speaking Mach Deutsch to her. Uh, in public, uh, just to kind of embarrass her, but it was, you know, during World War II, it doesn't seem to have reached the kind of proportions that it did in <coughs> World War I. So something that changed in the meantime. One of the things that I'm just speaking one of the things that had changed is that, for all practical purposes, German agriculture was dead by World War II. The German papers were gone. The government didn't directly forbid the printing of German papers, but what it did do was very clever. It stipulated that all German copy had to be sent to Washington to be read and censored for any possible war information. Unfortunately, oh, your paper isn't done yet. We'll get it back to you in a couple of weeks. So months later, the copy would come back. Who's going to buy old news? So it was one of the ways to actually stop the papers by making them submit copy for proofing. Yeah, I think that's right. But I think the um, repeal of prohibition might have helped somewhat. I don't know. I always think that. I mean, it didn't change the perception of Germans all around, but it, again, nothing was seen after that like what we saw in World War I, so maybe it helped. And World War II is kind of a war that I think 
he brings the country together, immigrant, those older immigrant groups anyway. I don't know, I felt like, I always feel like looking at the U.S. military then. There's a lot more of them in the military and it just brings the country together. Just, just remember that World War II, we incarcerated 140,000 yes. Japanese Americans in yes. the desert camps. And we also incarcerated 15,000 Germans and about 6,000 Italians. So how do you explain this? <laughs> what the group in the court last night talked about was, it seems the American history is always an in-group and an out-group. The Irish came in the 1840s, they were seen as dirty, as crime prone, as drinkers, as um, no good drifters. Um, the Jews, from the steps of the Pale of Russia, the steps of, of Eastern Europe, they were not really welcome in the 1890s after, and 1907 after the pogroms. So there's always been an in-group and an out-group. If you um, stay for the program, The Cow War, which is gonna get hard and hard to show as we talk, um, in the 1930s, we deported between a third to half a million Mexican Americans. Forced repatriation, although many have been born here, already in the 1600s in New Mexico. So there's always an in-group and an out-group. It seems we always manufacture winners and losers. Why do we do that? Is that inherent to capitalism? Is that inherent to Americanism? Why is it in this country there's always an in-group and an out-group? I will say that the recent um, discussion has been to send back Liberians and there was a demonstration last weekend in St. Paul, Minnesota. A Liberian s said, if we go back to Africa, there's no country to go back to. We left because of the Civil War. If we go back now, we have nothing. And most of us have no one. Before that was the Salvadorians. We should go back to El Salvador. And the other group were the Haitians. Notice they're all dark-skinned. Why do we always have to pester people who are dark? Why do we do that? No one's pestering me or you. Other questions, comments? Um, I'm a bit torn. At 4 o'clock, we will be showing um, the plan story, right? Um, I want to encourage you to encourage your professors to have me back. Um, one of the things that I heard yesterday in the core, I gave all three programs in the course of, of the day and the evening was that these are stories that no one really knew. And my question is, why don't we know these stories? Um, like the deportation, mass deportations of the Mexican Americans. Um, when you get to the cow war, again, if someone could quickly come and help me get into this, I'd be grateful. Can someone come and help me get this thing to show? Right, it should click and show, but it's not. Full screen is not up to show. Maybe view. Hang on. Anyway, we have a show about the cow war. Um, come at 4 o'clock, we'll show you the show about the Christmas plan. Any other questions? Thanks a lot. Thank